Okay, greetings. Um, my name is Dr. Richard Venditti, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the bioeconomy. Um, the learning objective for our lecture is to try to understand what we mean by a bioeconomy. This is um, going to be a bio-based circular economy, and hopefully it will have environmental and social benefits. There are also some challenges that we'll talk about. So I have a picture here of a plastic bottle. Um, truth is, is that that could come from petroleum or it could come from bio-based, biomass, renewable material. And what we're trying to do is kind of say, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this bioeconomy? Okay, so what I'd like to talk about first is non-renewable materials versus renewable materials. And I've got some examples here of non-renewable um, resources. So we know that petroleum and coal actually formed in the earth over millions of years and it's not being replaced even though we're consuming it at a very high rate. So this would be a considered a non-renewable material. Of particular interest are non-renewable carbon resources and the reason why these are so important is because we use them for electricity and for products, and when they're combusted and we utilize them, a lot of gases, global warming potential gases, go into the environment. And these can have um, long-lasting effects. The other thing is we make chemicals and materials out of these um, resources. And, uh, you know, general plastics like polystyrene or polyethylene um, are things that we can use to our advantage in society, but at end of life, what we find out is that they're not biocompatible. They're not environmentally friendly. And you can see examples of uh, terrible amounts of litter all across the globe and in our oceans. They're going into our food chains and they're affecting us. Now let's contrast that with renewable materials. Renewable materials actually come from raw materials that are replaced at least the amount that they are consumed. And we consider that sustainable. Okay? So my example down at the bottom here is we're going to make paper boxes. They serve a, a real strong need in society. Well, we've got to harvest the forests. And if we plant trees at the same rate that we're harvesting the forests, then the total stock of our forest resources will make, be maintained constant over time. In other words, future generations will be able to have the same amount of tree resources that we have right now. That's renewable, that's sustainable. That's really what is at the heart of a bioeconomy. Um, I talked about forests, but also, agricultural agriculture can be sustainable. Even grasses that we can use for commercial purposes can also be sustainable. All right, now let's talk about society and some of the products we've used over the years. One of the first renewable products that we used was actually just wood from trees. Um, early man used to cut down the wood, pile it up into a into a fire pit and then use it to cook and to keep warm. Um, that happened 400,000 years ago. And a great example of a renewable resource that we're still using today, almost in, in a similar fashion. Um, about 40,000 years ago, um, people were, uh, would take plant oils and animal fats, collect them and store them, and then kind of use this bioproduct um, to do heating and cooking and things like that. Um, there's evidence that there were cotton filaments spun 12,000 years ago. So here's another example of a renewable plant, cotton, that was produced, harvested, and then spun for clothing for people to, to meet one of society's needs. As you can see, all these things are renewable. All right, ethanol production. Um, back in the Egyptian days, um, uh, they learned how to ferment organic material and produce ethanol that had some benefits in the um, fact that it wouldn't spoil in the same way as other foods and drinks. Okay, so in the 1700s, 
um, people started to use coal, and that used that started to rival the use of wood for energy. Okay, so now coal is the first example of a widespread material that's non-renewable that society is using, and then as the industrial revolution um, occurred and steam engines and other types of equipment that could use this coal effectively really accelerated its use. So in the 1800s, um, we were still using wood as the main uh, raw material for a lot of the chemicals that we used and the materials that we produced. However, coal was actually um, about equal with wood with respect to energy. Finally, we can look in the t 1900s. This is where um, oil refining really took off. And once we were able to, oil, to refine the oil in a real effective way, we could start to make fuels out of it, chemicals, plastics, all of these things that uh, met society's needs. And in the 1900s, the, our amount of the renewable resources was a smaller fraction of the total materials that we were using. So in the 1900s, it's very important to understand that the inexpensive nature and then the nice products and the concentrated energy and all the unique properties of these non-renewable fossil fuel type materials start to really take over and dominate. Okay, what I'd like to do next is talk about a wasteful economy versus a effective economy. First example, wasteful economy. In a wasteful economy, we take fossil fuels and fossil carbon, we refine them, make products that we need, use them once, and then either send them to a landfill or they find themselves as litter in the environment. Along the way of manufacturing these materials, we get byproducts and wastes, and those also find their, their way to the environment. This is very wasteful. All right, now what I'd like to do is contrast that system with a system based on bioproducts. Now let's take a look. Um, in this system right here, let's just say we're going to make some bioproducts to meet the needs of society. Okay, so there are our bioproducts, and they come from the factories, obviously. So we're making our bioproducts. Now, the bioproducts, um, the raw material for them in the factories is the biomass. So we've got trees, agriculture, and and um, animals. Now what happens is when we manufacture the bioproduct, we emit some CO2, some carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that's kind of interesting because what does the biomass need to be made? Well, the inputs for the biomass are gonna be the sunlight and it's gonna actually be just the CO2. And then we're also gonna need some water and we're going to need input from the soil. And so all these things go in there. But what's very interesting is this circular part of my diagram. The carbon dioxide that's emitted from making those bioproducts can be reabsorbed in the plant material that we are considering renewable as our starting source for making the bioproduct. So this is the power of the bioeconomy. All right, so now let's just kind of um, review that kind of concept. What we're going to do is we're going to make biomass. So we're going to have agricultural systems, forestry systems, and, and water systems. We're going to add sun, water, carbon dioxide, and nutrients from the soil. And then we'll harvest the biomass off that and get our biomass feedstock. Then we will do refining. Just like oil is refined into multiple products, we will refine our biomass into multiple products. For instance, electricity, chemicals, paper, other things. So we'll get all our bioproducts for society. Then what we will have is we'll use that material. Maybe there'll be some byproducts and some waste. We'll try to recycle some back, but for the most part, these materials will be biocompatible. They'll be compatible with the environment. And what will happen is they will be able to be incorporated into the ecosystems, either the air, the water, or the soil, and then go right back into our biomass preparation. And this circular bioeconomy is renewable, 
and it's sustainable. So that's why we like it. All right, so next let's just talk about some definitions. I've already mentioned um, sustainable materials and we're gonna say biorenewable resources are, the definition would be organic materials of recent origin. So it didn't take a million years to produce, it might have taken five years or 20 or 40 years. But those are created from renewable resources like sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, that's great. And we're gonna say they're sustainable if they are regenerated at the same rate as we consume them, okay? And what that means is that there'll be a steady state amount of this re resource for future generations. Um, fossil fuels, we've already gone over those. Um, they are also from organic materials, but the important difference is, is that they were generated over millions of years. And the fact is, is that we not, we're not gonna be around to um, another million years here to um, see them being regenerated. We're gonna consume them, okay? So they're not renewed and they're not sustainable. Okay, then we're gonna talk about bioenergy and bioproducts. Bioenergy is the conversion of any type of biomass to a stationary heat or electricity generating plant, okay? So we might produce steam or we might produce electricity, but the plant is just stationary. Now, bioproducts, what we'll do is we'll talk about bioproducts as any material from a biorenewable resource other than bioenergy. So that could include chemicals, fibers, wood, paper, food. Um, it could even, um, you could even consider it a liquid fuel, which is a little bit confusing because you think, oh, maybe that's a bioenergy. But if it's a liquid fuel that goes into a non-stationary device, like a car or a bus or a train, we're gonna consider that a bioproduct. So bioethanol that we put into our cars or biodiesel, we would consider those bioproducts. So just to kind of summarize what I just said, we're gonna make bioenergy and bioproducts. Bioenergy are things like steam and electricity produced in a stationary place. Bioproducts are materials, chemicals, and even fuels that are used in non-stationary devices. And of course, we're gonna use renewable biomass sources and convert those in hopefully in an environmentally friendly way. All right, now let's just kind of talk about the existing U.S. bioproducts industry. I mean, most people know already about food and pharmaceuticals. Those are bioproducts, but what we're going to talk about are some of the things not included in there. So the U.S. bioproducts industry is tracked by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And what they have estimated that bioproducts in the U.S. are about $400 billion in value. And that, that equates to about um, people working in that industry of about 4.2 million jobs. That's very, very significant. Um, and there's lots of different products that we make. Over 90, about 97 product categories, 14,000 different products recognized by the, uh, the USDA. Um, and then I just show a little bit of the rankings on the right here. North Carolina is actually about 90,000 direct jobs related to the bioproducts industry. And think about it, that does not include food, so that's, that's a big deal. And then in North Carolina, we've got about $6.4 billion worth of products, valuable products that we are selling. When you think about bioproducts, um, there are some that are very traditional that most people think about, like tissue paper, um, kitchen toweling at home, and uh, wood paneling and wood flooring, wood decking, um, and all the structural lumber that goes into a house. So those are conventional ones, and those are bioproducts, and those are extremely valuable. But there are other things that we might not think about. For instance, your cell phone, your uh, smartphone, the um, display on the outside is actually a cellulose-based material. Cellulose is a chemical that we can extract from wood. It's the main component of wood. And as we process it and purify it and convert it into a semi-plastic, we can use it for very high-tech applications. Um, that shirt I'm showing right there is made out of rayon. Rayon is also from wood. So again, we take fibers from the tree, we convert them into uh, different chem with different chemistries, and then we spin actual fibers and filaments out of it, and we can make very... Um, 
very attractive and comfortable clothing. Um, the cup down at the bottom right, it's made out of PLA, polylactic acid, and that's actually derived from corn. Um, we're also showing here um, a 10% ethanol fuel. Um, so that ethanol is coming from cornstarch and the conversion of cornstarch to ethanol. And then there are some other examples like glues and the Coca-Cola bottle that has um, a substantial amount of natural uh, biomass that's converted into the plastic for that bottle. So it's all around us in lots of different, different um, products that we use. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is talk about why should we be using bio-based energy in products. We already found out that the carbon cycle is an important one, and there are other advantages too. So the first thing I would say is that there are improved environmental impacts compared to fossil resources, and not just carbon dioxide. There's lots of other different ones that um, there's advantages with biomass and bio products. Um, for instance, mining ore and drilling for oil have implications to our land. Um, when we burn coal, we get a coal ash that is actually disposed of in water, and you might have heard of coal ash ponds that uh, have um, leaked and um, gone, the coal ash pollutants have gone into the rivers. Um, and then, of course, when we burn the fossil fuels, not only carbon dioxide, but other components that cause acid rain, and particulates that have human health hazards. So in general, we would like to move away from these kinds of non-renewable resources. Now, another reason why we want to use bio-based energy in products is for national security. It turns out that the United States consumes quite a bit of oil, about 20 million barrels per day. And as shown in this graph, what you see is that we have to import almost half of that into the country. And so during times of conflict or problems with the weather or other kind of upsetting um, phenomena, we may not have enough oil to import into our country for all our needs. It would be great if we could be secure in our energy needs internally so that we had better control over in troubling times. Another reason why we should uh, think that it's important to uh, use bio-based energy in products is rural development. Um, the United States is very fortunate to have massive amounts of rural area that are actually productive lands for agriculture and forests. And despite all this and billions of dollars in farm subsidies, uh, making a living off crops and even forests sometimes can be very difficult. And so what's happening is population is migrating to urban settings. And that means an abandonment of rural communities. And really what that means is that the people, um, the loss of the people there in the rural areas, um, we're losing our ability to gain the benefits of all these natural resources that the United States has. So down at the bottom here, I'm showing a picture of corn. It may be more difficult to make a living off selling low-valued corn kernels. However, if those corn kernels can be processed into such uh, a polymer that we can make plastics, like this polylactic acid cup over here on the right, that might make the corn more valuable and the products that we make from it more valuable. And maybe at that point, um, it would be easier to make a living and a career um, in a rural setting. Now, another important part about bioproducts is that they're compatible with the environment. Fossil-based plastics, while they're very valuable to us and they serve a real need, they're not recycled at a very high rate. A lot of them find them their way into landfills and into the environment as litter. And the problem is, is that they persist, they persist in the environment. They actually make their way and get into our food chain. They actually absorb toxic materials and when small microorganisms eat that toxic material and then that goes into shrimps or fish or larger animals and then we finally eat them, that has a direct impact on wildlife and on people. Um, if you contrast that with bio-based products, things like paper, cotton, starch, these are natural. They grow in nature. They degrade naturally in nature. 
when they go into the nature, they are incorporated back into the soil. Maybe some CO2 is emitted, but in general, um, they can be utilized by the environment in a nice way. Microorganisms aren't transformed into different things. And so um, very powerful that our bio-based products can be incorporated. Okay, I've talked a lot about advantages of bioproducts, but now let's talk about some challenges. What kind of questions do we need to answer in order to use biomass more productively? Um, well, one of the problems with biomass is that they're typically low density solids, okay? So what that means is if they're solids like wood or um, <clears throat> corn kernels, things like that, they're harder to transport. We can't just put them in a pipe and pump them along just like we can oil or natural gas. So they're very difficult to transport. Now, transportation can be a real issue because um, the other problem with uh, uh, biomass is that <clears throat> they're low density. In, in other words, they're very bulky. And that bulk leads itself to having a low energy density per unit volume. So here in this um, picture, I'm showing three different types of material, all with the same energy content. But what you notice is to get the same energy content, you've got to have a lot bigger volume of straw than you would of coal. So you can imagine that the transport, the collection, the storage, all these things that are kind of are sensitive to the amount, the volume of material are going to be more difficult for straw than coal. One other issue, when we store coal, coal is what we call hydrophobic. So it doesn't absorb a lot of water. The water just kind of repels off, it beads up and rolls off. That's not the same case for wood and straw. When we harvest the wood and straw, um, we call it green from the green state. And what that means is that there's a lot of water and moisture in living plants. So we know that's a problem. And then during storage, if we store it outdoors and it rains, the straw or the wood will pick up moisture. So that's also an issue. And the, uh, the moisture actually, um, like when we go to burn the straw, as you can imagine, if you try to burn wet straw, you don't get as much energy. You get a lot of smoke and not as much energy. So that can be also a drawback of biomass. Another challenge for biomass is that it is living material um, after we harvest it, um, that material is biocompatible. In other words, the environment can take it and degrade it and put it back into soil. Great for when it's um, end of life, but when we're trying to store it and use it, that's a problem because it can degrade while we store it. Another issue is that there's just a variable composition. Um, when you get oil from the ground, if you know where you got it from, in general, you know exactly what the composition is, and you've got a large volume of that um, same composition. For plants, it's not the same. There are different species of plants, and then there are different ways that they're grown, the growing condition. And then disease and pests can also make the biomass more variable. So that can be a very big problem. If you have a factory and you want to have a constant, consistent, raw input material, and you've got this variable biomass coming in that can cause problems in your product quality. Another thing that's very practical but a very serious problem is dirt and rocks. Um, because we're harvesting them from soil area, agriculture and forests, um, it's not uncommon to have some mineral type materials um, come in with the plants. And those dirt and rocks, they can abrade equipment, they cause yield losses, and all kinds of different problems. So those are all challenges. Another um, challenge for biorenewable resources is um, the competition between food and the bioproduct utilization. So for instance, corn. A lot of people question whether we should be using corn to fuel our cars or to make plastics out of. Why? Because they feel like if the corn is all going to those applications that the food, the food supply and the food would go down and the food prices would go up. And then there would be some populations that would have a harder time getting the food that they need. So that's a challenge. The last challenge 
and not the least important. This one is very, very important. The last challenge I'll, I'll mention for bioproducts is one that's extremely important. And the fact is, is that petroleum-based products are really, really cheap. And as a society, we become addicted to those low price products and the convenience of using them. Um, when we have a bioproduct, it's not that um, inexpensive. So I give this example. Polystyrene is about five cents per pound. And so you could make a um, disposable plate out of the polystyrene foam for five cents a pound. Contrast that to paper, 30 cents a pound to make a paper plate, almost six times more expensive. And although 25 cents a pound doesn't sound like a lot, if you multiply that over the millions and millions of plates that we're using or cups or films or bags, that adds up. Um, you see a lot of grocery stores that um, basically give you uh, plastic bags away for free because they're so inexpensive. And then you have to ask for the paper. Well, the major part of that is that the paper bags are a little bit more expensive. So that's a challenge um, that uh, bioproducts have and that we have to address. Okay, so let me just kind of summarize with what I think the bioeconomy of the future might look like. First part, really important, we're going to grow and harvest biomass in a sustainable way. That's the first thing. Second thing is we're going to convert these to products that meet society's needs. And then the third thing is that bioeconomy has to be economically competitive. So we have to realize that there are petroleum products out there, they're cheap. And how do we compete with them on a dollar per dollar basis? Okay. Why is this important? Why is this exciting to me? What we need are young people that have a lot of enthusiasm, that want to do the right thing for the earth and people, and are smart and are ready to go and improve life for us. Okay. I think if we have those kinds of young people in our in our in our bio economy. We will have a sustainable circular process that meets the society's needs and is compatible with the environment. Thank you for your attention.